right, we can uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to this session about partnerships uh, that strengthen diverse climate resilient communities. Um, my name is Sydney and I work for NIFWIF on their Chesapeake program and I will be one of the facilitators during this session today. Um, and just a note that this session will be recorded and this recording will be made available at a later date. Um, please use the chat box for any um, issues that you may be having concerning technical problems and either myself or um, one of the other facilitators will help you. Um, in addition, please feel free to put any content questions into the chat throughout this session. Um, we do encourage you to rename yourself with your preferred name, pronouns, and organization. Um, in order to do so, you can hover over yourself and then you'll see a little triple dot option that if you click that drop down menu will show the option of rename. Um, and lastly, this is a final uh, session, one of the final sessions of the forum. Um, and so if you want to make sure that you give feedback later on, we'll get to that at the end. Um, you'll want to go into SCED into this session and, and I'll drop that link into the chat. Um, and if we wanna to go to the next slide, just to show some of those housekeeping. Yep, thanks, okay. Um, so we went through these, but I will turn it over now to our speakers for today. Thank you so much and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the District of Columbia's Department of Energy and the Environment and the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. Welcome to Partnerships Strengthen Diverse Climate Resilient Communities. My name is Bryden and Durkin, and I'm an Environmental Protection Specialist with the River Smart Homes Program at DOEE. Uh, allow me to introduce my colleagues, Laura Todd and Elaine Vidal. Thanks for joining us, everybody, after your lunch for our last forum session today. Thank you. So happy to have you all here. Thank you, Elaine and Laura. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So today we're gonna ground our discussion of partnerships, diversity, and climate resilient communities in the context of the River Smart Homes Program. River Smart Homes is an incentive program for residential properties in DC to improve safe stormwater retention and to reduce pollution uh, and stormwater runoff directed to our waterways in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. We will encourage a discussion of partnerships as links that broaden the reach of our program. These partnerships augment the capacities of my agency, our nonprofit partners, our contracted businesses and installers, our residents, and the broader neighborhoods and communities of the District of Columbia. So here we're excited to share an activity mapping those connections and River Smart's reach. We'll discuss the Inspire Green Report on justice, equity, diversion, di diversity, and inclusion, here referred to as JEDI. And we'll wrap up by discussing the steps we're taking to promote JEDI and our partnerships. Next slide. We have a poll question for you today. And it's gonna be, what is your favorite major river in the Chesapeake Bay watershed? We'll give you just a, a few minutes uh, to answer this question. All right. So it looks like we got uh, quite a few participants. Uh, and we'll go ahead and end the polling there. So as you can see, we've got uh, a diverse uh, attendance today, uh, people from the Susquehanna who enjoy the Susquehanna, the Potomac, uh, the York River isn't getting any love today, that's okay. Uh, the Rappahannock and James are all represented. So welcome, thank you. Go to the next slide. So what, what is stormwater? Uh, some of you may be familiar with stormwater, but to bring us all on board, stormwater is the precipitation that falls onto impervious surfaces, rooftops, patios, parking pads, sidewalks, and streets. That water is directed and runs off to storm sewers and ultimately discharge into our waterways. We'll go to the next slide. We've got, what are the evidence of stormwater? Some of you may have witnessed evidence of stormwater uh, during the storm named Zeta yesterday, and maybe you're seeing the aftermath today. We see overwhelmed gutters, uh, streets and water and alleyways that are uh, directing uh, water ultimately to our stormwater catch basins. 
we'll go to the next slide. So in the District of Columbia, it's a, a dense urban area. 43% uh, of that land surface is impervious surface. So you can imagine uh, as, there, as a raindrop, you've got a pretty, uh, pretty good chance, almost a coin flip of landing on permeable or impermeable surface. For the average storm in DC, about an inch, uh, 1.2 inches, it produces roughly 525 million gallons of stormwater runoff. So this is a significant uh, issue that, that we need to address. There's a great need to address uh, interception, infiltration, and retention, as almost half of DC's land cover is going to contribute uh, water to our storm sewers. Next slide. Stormwater runoff, what is it? What does it do? Since we're nested in the context of the Chesapeake Bay watershed, and the Chesapeake Bay watershed is a vast and it has the vast, vast and diverse land use, uh, we see uh, it stretches across uh, five states, um, multiple cities, counties. Uh, as stormwater moves across this landscape, it picks up uh, pollutants that uh, carries directly to our storm, uh, storm waterways. Uh, as well as sediments uh, and, and erosion. So what can we do about stormwater? In the District of Columbia, DOEE is incentivizing uh, homeowners to capture and safely retain stormwater on site to improve interception of that stormwater, to diminish erosion, to improve infiltration, to recharge groundwater, and to improve uh, retention. Next slide. Our program goals, fundamentally, we want to clean DC's waterways, reduce that volume of stormwater runoff, prevent ro erosion, and recharge groundwater. Also, we're interested in increasing, increasing habitat diversity and promoting conservation, and getting district homeowners and residents on board, educating them about the significance of this issue and what they can do to assist. How do we do this? Green infrastructures. BMP is also known as best management practices. These are an approach to water management that's going to mimic the natural water cycle. It also improves water quality, reduces flooding, increases wildlife habitat, and improves air quality. Next slide. In the River Smart Homes program, we incentivize the use of five BMPs, five green infrastructure practices. Our most popular is rain barrels. Uh, these are uh, cisterns that are over 100 gallons that connect to a downspout. They redirect that uh, water uh, and hold it in the cistern uh, so that it can be used or discharged at a later date when storm sewers are not uh, being uh, inundated. We also have our most effective practice in rain gardens, directing those downspouts into specialized gardens that can help to infiltrate that water into the groundwater. We also have a native landscaping opportunity, we refer to it as bayscaping. Uh, this is largely to control uh, erosion on slopes using deep-rooted plants uh, to not only hold on to those slopes, but also to improve that water infiltration. Shade trees are also an awesome tool uh, for intercepting that water before it hits the ground, for infiltrating, allowing that water to get into the ground, and then through the roots, uh, retaining that water uh, in the tree itself. We also offer a rebate program uh, for removing impervious surfaces and replacing it with either vegetation or permeable pavement. Next slide. Our process takes just about uh, a year on in in uh, takes just about a year uh, from the time a homeowner submits an application to DOEE. Uh, they get it placed in line uh, for a stormwater site audit. Uh, DOEE auditor. Uh, goes to the site, determines what which one of these BMPs uh, the homeowner is eligible for. Uh, the home the report gets written, and the homeowner uh, elects to uh, do whichever BMP uh, works for them uh, and what they're interested in doing. From there, uh, the the audit and the homeowner are teamed up with our nonprofit partners, either the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay or Casey Trees, to install those projects. Next slide, please. So who are those actors? River Smart Homes homeowners uh, approach the district government uh, and, and DOEE. They get uh, sorted into our River Smart Homes team, as I mentioned. 
uh, those uh, environmental protection specialists will then audit properties uh, and link them up with uh, the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay and Casey Trees. Uh, from there, Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay and Casey Trees take the reins uh, and either uh, delegate that work to local contractors uh, or small businesses, uh, or they do the installations themselves. So from here, we'll go into a mind mapping exercise, how these uh, various actors are connected. And I'll hand this off to Laura. Awesome, thank you, Brendan. Um, so for those of you who attended forum last year, you might be familiar with a concept called mind mapping. You may have even uh, done one last year. So first I'm gonna walk us through um, kind of a general mind map of the River Smart program. And a mind map is really just a non-linear way to visualize a concept. And it really focuses on the relationships between the different aspects that are represented in the mind map. So, um, we have an example for you today of a mind, mind map to visualize some of the partnerships uh, that go into making the River Smart Homes program. So if you see there at the center, you'll see the River Smart logo is kind of like the central concept in this mind map with a lot of branching um, aspects coming off of that. So as Brendan mentioned, some of the actors in the program, the two nonprofit partners are Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay and Casey Trees. So the Alliance is managing the installation of rain barrels, all of the landscaping practices, as well as the permeable surface rebate program that is removing and replacing a hardscape with either vegetation or permeable pavement. Um, and I know the, the font size may be a little bit small for you all to see on the screen share, but I'll go into um, everything that you can see here today on this mind map. So um, we kind of have it color coded a little bit to represent the different uh, players at hand. So anything that you see in yellow is kind of a, a private association. So the Alliance works with a number of contractors to facilitate um, all of these installations. So we also work with manufacturers, uh, the manufacturers of our rain barrels, as well as of the permeable pavement systems that we're installing. We work with local nurseries to source our native plants. And you can see these lines kind of starting to connect how these partners are coming into play. So um, while the Alliance isn't necessarily working with the nurseries directly, we're working with the contractors who have those relationships with the nurseries. Um, uh, some other things that you'll see in yellow off of the River Smart logo is working with realtors and Inspire Green, which Elaine is going to be um, getting more in depth with later on. Um, so we've had partnerships with realtors in the past because we work on private residential property. You know, these properties change hands a lot of the time, and we want folks to know about the program consistently when they're buying a new house that already has River Smart practices, or if they have a house that's newly constructed and they have opportunities for some of these. As well. Um, you'll see homeowners associations there too. Um, in blue, we work with homeowners. So uh, from the DOEE staff to the Alliance to Casey Trees, we're all working one-on-one um, -on -one with these homeowners. Um, in green, we also work with industry experts and the Alliance has worked um, with a contractor to do a lot of translation of our contractor trainings. That's something that we offer um, twice a year for our rain barrel and landscaping contractor trainings and once a year for our permeable pavement installers, just to try to make that uh, more accessible for as many folks, as well as different agencies um, like the District Department of Transportation and working with neighborhood associations to promote the program as well. So the mind map is really just a tool for you to start to visualize all of these partnerships and it just kind of starts centrally and expands further and further out and you can start to kind of visualize those relationships in a new way. We can go on to the next slide. Alrighty, so we're going to take some time uh, for you all to start thinking about your own mind maps for your own uh, projects and partnerships that you have. Um, so in a second here, Sydney is going to be sending, oh, there it is, perfect, um, a link to Jamboards, and they're sorted by your last name. So you'll want to click on the board that corresponds to your last name. I know some of you probably have used Jamboard um, over the past two days with Forum, but if you have not used Jamboard before, um, when you open up that link, it's going to be a blank screen and a blank frame. 
um, and it won't have all of these sticky notes or images on it or anything, but you'll see this icon that's here at the top of the two black rectangles um, and some arrows there. So you'll wanna go to a blank slide after you open that with your last name, and you can kind of claim it by putting a sticky note or writing with the pen tool, which you'll see on that left-hand bar in Jamboard to be able to claim your slide. That'll be your space for your um, project or partnership that you're gonna be looking at today. So um, we will be staying on um, the call. If any of you all have questions, feel free to unmute yourself um, or type your questions in the chat. And we will have some kind of prompts for you in this time when you all uh, are taking to think about your partnerships. But we encourage you with the theme of today's presentation to consider diversity, equity, and inclusion and justice um, in your partnerships for your project. So as we're kind of going through that, this activity. Think about the players who are already um, in your partnership, in your project, but also take time to think about who's missing. Who are some new partners that you could engage um, that you haven't at this point, or what partners could you better engage um, in your project? So with that, um, we're going to have around 10 minutes for you all to be working on this uh, Jamboard activity. And also as well, if you're more old school and don't want to use this, I prefer pen and paper. You're more than welcome to do that as well. Um, and like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and put them in the chat. And we'll um, expect you to go back here um, in 10 minutes. We'll put a little prompt um, in the chat as well for you all to kind of return to the room for the next part of the session. Thanks. Alrighty, so I invite you all to put a pause on your mind maps. This link will still be um, available to you always to continue to work on this after today's session. Um, but we invite you to just bring your attention back to the presentation for another poll question. And Elaine is going to take it from here. Thank you so much, Laura. So for the past few minutes, you have had the opportunity to think about the partnerships that you currently have, maybe um, who's already at the table, who might not be at the table, um, and maybe kind of get the gears turning in terms of um, thinking about issues of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, and how you can help um, facilitate those objectives within your organization and also through uh, using your partnerships. So um, thinking along those lines um, and taking a look at your mind map that you've done, um, take a look to, uh, to assess kind of where are you now in your organization? How would you um, how would you sort of um, describe yourself? So um, we have five categories in the poll. The first is no experience. Um, and if you could um, click those um, poll options, those will come up. Um, so, you know, maybe you're at a no experience level um, where it hasn't been a major focus of achieving your organization's mission yet or haven't really started those conversations yet. You might be at a beginner level where you have set goals and had discussions, but not really implemented them. You might be at an intermediate level where you're actively working on um, justice, equity, and inclusion and diversity issues um, and have implemented some concrete efforts. You might be advanced where you've actually seen results based on those efforts, or you might be an expert um, where you can really say that your organization is a, a model. Um, so go ahead and, um, and kind of um, take stock of where you are, where you might describe yourself. And it looks like uh, we have a lot of organizations um, that are um, at the beginner, intermediate, and, and advanced levels. So it looks like we have 35% of organizations are having these conversations, but maybe haven't um, started to implement any actions yet. Um, good. And then we have um, most, of, most of our participants, 56% would say they're at the intermediate level where they have made significant um, adjustments or efforts and are now um, working on those. And 11% are advanced, where they're really saying, um, you know, that that uh, the the work is shown in in the results and and the impact, and that's great. That's a that's a great place to be. Um, and uh, and just you know, for full disclosure, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, 
the actions that River Smart Homes has taken and our partners have taken and that we're working on together to facilitate JEDI in our, in our program and implementations. Um, but, um, you know, I don't necessarily think that we would say that we are advanced in that, um, in those regards. I would say that we're, um, you know, intermediate to advanced. And we'll talk about some of the initiatives that we've taken, um, some of the challenges that we're working through, and hopefully you can um, uh, see our efforts and then um, get ideas for your own efforts within your own organization. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, for those of us that aren't from DC, um, here's some, some background information. So the district is divided up into eight wards. And those eight wards drain into three major watersheds. So you can see here, the eight wards are outlined in pink and the watersheds, the Potomac River, the Anacostia River um, and Rock Creek are um, in blue. And um, we use wards a lot of times in the district because they are um, geographical areas, collections of neighborhoods that are represented in the municipal government and then often receive um, services or packages together. So you can think of a ward almost analogous to a county. Um, so we have eight different wards. And then when we think about uh, issues of um, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, we are often, um, focusing outreach toward Ward 7 and Ward 8 because those communities have been historically disenfranchised um, through for, for many um, through many many processes and so River Smart Homes wants to be part of the solution um, not part of the problem and we want to disrupt patterns of inequity um, in, in, uh, in our program. And so part of the, the inequity that we see uh, for Ward 7 and Ward 8 is looking at the Anacostia River, which borders Ward 7 and Ward 8 to the north. Uh, we can see that uh, 2,500 acres of its original tidal wetlands um, are gone with only 150 acres remaining. Um, and then prior to 2018, Washington's combined sewer system has annually dumped over 2 billion gallons of raw sewage and storm water into the Anacostia River every year. Um, and this um, is in large part mitigated due to the completion of um, a tunnel project, um, but the, these um, historic inequities are reasons that um, we really want to focus on Ward 7 and, and Ward 8 um, and make sure that we are disrupting those patterns. Next slide, please. Uh, so here you can see the home ownership breakdown in the district by race and ethnicity. Um, just to give some context, you can see that um, in the Northwest section, we see a predominantly white home ownership. Um, in the Southeast quadrant, we see um, a higher percentage of uh, Black and African American home ownership. Um, and then North in Ward 4, we see higher percentages of uh, Latinx home ownership. So that kind of gives you a sense of um, the racial makeup, makeup of different geographic areas throughout the city. And if we can move on to the next slide. But we also see uh, income disparities across the district. So you can see that um, the, the wealthiest, um, most affluent areas are concentrated again up in the Northeast quadrant um, and that we see lower median household incomes um, down in the Southeast quadrant. Um, and again, those are reasons why um, River Smart Homes wants to um, make sure that we are part of the solution and, and providing um, equitable access, especially to those areas. Next slide, please. So how are we doing in terms of um, home owner um, participation in terms of our, our BEMP installations? So you can take a look at this graph, which shows um, our total installations over the history of the program. So it's about 12 years um, in the orange column. And then you can see our recent installations from the year 2019 in the blue column. So we can kind of take a look at this data and see, you know, how, um, what are the participation levels like across different wards and where are the opportunities for improvement? 
So um, it might stand out to you that Ward 1 and Ward 2 are very low uh, participation, and that's to be expected because they are um, really heavily developed downtown areas that are paved and don't have a lot of opportunities for green infrastructure. Um, and then you can take a look at Ward 6 and see a, a lower participation um, rate there for many, many of the same reasons. Um, and then, you know, we can look at Ward 7 and, and Ward 8, and we can see that um, historically those wards have had lower participation, um, looking at 11% um, over the history of the program in Ward 7 and 5% over the history of Ward, uh, sorry, 5% over the history of the program in Ward 8. And we can see that there's uh, definitely room for improvement there in terms of um, you know, comparing to, to the other wards. And then we can see that um, from some of the actions that we have taken and our partners have taken together, we have been able to increase participation in, um, in the last years, uh, rising from five to 8% in Ward 8 and from 11 to 16%. So we can see some of the um, actions that we've taken coming to some positive results. Uh, next slide, please. So in assessing where we are, um, we have seen some improvement and that's uh, largely based, uh, uh, that's largely attributable to actions that we've taken, that the Alliance has taken um, in response to um, an Inspire Green report. So Inspire Green is a district-based uh, consulting firm that conducted a six month study on uh, participation of residents in Ward 7 and 8 um, back in 2018. And they met with residents, they conducted focus groups, demonstration tours, and attended local neighborhood meetings. Um, and they gave us some recommendations for how we can um, improve our service to Ward 7 and 8. Next slide, please. So they came back with a lot of really great feedback. Um, and first, they um, wanted us to understand that one size does not fit all. And though we have, you know, kind of standard procedures and processes in the program, we needed to be flexible and we needed to be able to make accommodations when necessary. So that's um, a big uh, element of feedback that they gave to us. Um, they also wanted us to meet homeowners where they are. And by that, they meant meet them where they physically are. <laughs> so go to the um, neighborhood meetings where residents are going. Go to their, um, their church groups or their civic organizations or their events, public events, to be actually physically present um, where people are already gathering and become part of the community. Uh, and then along these lines of becoming part of the community, they advised us to um, recruit homeowners as ambassadors for the program, again, to um, you know, embed ourselves within the fabric that is already, already exists in, in um, these communities. Um, they also advised us to try to clear up the message of River Smart Homes in terms of being um, transparent about successes and failures where we need to improve as an agency um, and, and also managing expectations about what exactly we're able to provide and do. And then um, always hitting home, staying present in the community, being part of the fabric, being, um, you know, being a member of the team, a member of the community um, that is permanent. Um, and then they suggested a timeline for us to um, implement some of these um, actions and reassess. So that's kind of where we are now. Um, and if you'll move to the next slide, we have um, implemented a number of, um, of actions and so has the Alliance, um, trying to again, leverage those partnerships for multiplier effects. Uh, so we increased our outreach efforts in Ward 7 and 8 um, in the ways that they suggested. We also um, introduced signage efforts to increase citizen awareness. So you can see um, our BMPs uh, are installed with signage if the homeowner would like so that other homeowners who are walking around, walking their dogs, um, can you know, see, see what has happened in other properties if they'd like to participate. 
We've also increased our online resources so that um, information is available at any time to, to everyone. We're developing a landscaping um, maintenance program and Alliance has really taken the lead on this in terms of um, working with contractors to help um, you know, provide options to homeowners if they want support maintaining their practices. Um, and then again, um, recruiting River Smart ambassadors to help us um, you know, be part of the community and be embedded. And then other actions, not even on the slide, are um, you know, that Alliance has um, at, uh, uh, in response to feedback um, offered their contractor trainings in um, both English and Spanish. Um, and that has also taken um, many steps and, and, and spends um, countless hours helping to support and incubate um, new contractors who are coming into the, this business. So helping um, minority owned business, businesses break into this field. Next slide. And, um, and so we feel very proud of these efforts, but we also recognize that, um, you know, we are, we encounter challenges and there's always room for improvement. So um, some of the challenges are that, um, you know, the River Smart Homes program um, has become pretty popular. <laughs> and so we struggle with how to, you know, serve all the residents who are interested, um, you know, despite the increased wait times that they may experience and how do we give a really high um, quality of service despite those wait times. Um, and that has um, necessitated increased communication. Uh, we also like many organizations have, um, have run into challenges in our outreach efforts um, due to the pandemic because um, so much of our kind of efforts in the community are, um, are can be focused on in person to person interactions. And that has really been emphasized as an important component. So we're trying to replace that. Um, but as we know, that can be challenging. So we're trying to replace it with phone calls, with um, figuring out ways to um, have that interaction without um, being able to you know, see people face to face. And then, of course, um, with the program popularity, we are having to find efficiencies in terms of our personnel capacity, um, find ways to reach out to more people and move faster um, with the resources that we have. And then, um, of course, um, managing expectations about what the program offers and being able to consistently meet those expectations. Next slide, please. So as we are um, confronting those challenges, we are considering, you know, how, how do we take, um, how do we go, move to the next level in terms of meeting justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion objectives? And so um, we're in the process of, um, you know, implementing some next steps um, and having conversations toward new goals and new changes, which may include uh, higher installation rates in Ward 7 and Ward 8, potentially um, prioritizing those communities. Um, also developing co-pay alternatives for um, BMPs for low income participants. So um, each BMP, the homeowner pays um, traditionally about 10% of the cost, but again, we need to be flexible and make changes on a case by case basis. Um, we're also again, working to replace in-person outreach strategies with phone communications, um, and other communications to stay engaged, stay part of the community, um, even though we can't do person to person as much. Again, we're trying to figure out um, how that applies to the River Smart Homes Ambassadors Program. How do we pivot um, uh, to, how do we pivot that program in this new environment? Um, and then also working with River Smart Communities to continue large scale community plantings in Ward 7 and 8 for apartment buildings, community centers, churches, and uh, recreation centers. Next slide. So that's kind of a snapshot of our organization's journey and where we are in that journey toward um, facilitating more just, more equitable, more inclusive, and more um, 
diverse goals. And obviously, you know, we're not there yet. There's tons of work to do. Um, but hopefully this snapshot can, um, can get your, can, can help you think about where your organization is in terms of these efforts. And um, what we'd like to do now is break everybody into breakout rooms so that we can have a discussion around those. Um, and we'd like you to take kind of what we have shared about our journey and think about your journey and discuss. So we're asking you to look at two questions. First, what is your organization's experience implementing JEDI initiatives across partnerships? So where are you now? What succeeded? What, what is challenging? And then secondly, keeping in mind where you are now with these um, efforts, what are some next steps that you are thinking about? So again, um, two questions. Where are you now in efforts toward uh, JEDI initiatives? And what are the next steps from where you are? So we'll be in these breakout rooms for 15 minutes um, and you'll be placed in them shortly. And then after 15 minutes of discussion, we'll come back and, um, and uh, relate as a group. Hi there, thank you everyone. Um, I know that um, the group I was in had some really great discussion and um, shared some really interesting um, and, and um, informative thoughts with me. So I thought I would share what my group talked about um, and then maybe I, maybe we could open the floor to others to share um, what their group kind of discussed for takeaways. Um, and um, my group, it was interesting. I was hearing that um, that in their organizations they had um, systems in place to elevate um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice concerns um, from you know kind of lower levels to upper levels. So they, it seemed like those systems of communication and elevating concerns and making sure that those concerns were heard were really important and effective. Um, and then, you know, some of the challenges I heard um, were in terms of, um, you know, partnerships are um, relationships that are built between people, right? So if people within different organizations or partnerships move, then how do you keep that partnership strong if those, um, you know, person-to-person -person linkages um, change. So um, those were some really interesting thoughts from the folks um, that I was able to chat with. Anyone else want to chime in with some thoughts? We had uh, some interesting uh, discussion in our group about um, sort of the, the, the challenges of, of uh, organizing events um, or trainings and uh, how, how you might uh, gear uh, a single event or a single training uh, to begin to, to bring in a, com a, a community or in, in uh, this instance, uh, Spanish language uh, 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 participants. Um, but if you don't uh, follow up with that, uh, if, 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 there, if it's just a one-time thing, it's, uh, it's, it's, not as, it's not effective. That, um, bringing in uh, language services uh, to continue that partnership uh, is essential. That's a great point. And, um, you know, we have um, also encountered the need and, and the need to facilitate language access in our programs as well, which is a, a really important point. Um, would anyone else from, um, uh, from our team or our participants like to share any of the takeaways or thoughts that they had during the breakout? And if not, that's okay too. There's a lot of, um, these are, are big issues and sometimes it, it takes time to um, kind of think them over and, um, uh, and weigh them internally. Um, but since we have a little bit of time left, um, I'd like to open the floor for questions. If you have questions about um, the River Smart Home Program or our partners, Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, anything that we discussed in the presentation, you can um, add it to the chat or, um, 
or um, feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask it directly. I have a question. Um, I was wondering with the River Smart Homes, are you, are you seeing any differences uh, between the different wards in terms of what people are looking for in those BMPs or, or what attracts them to having them on their property? That's a really good question. Um, and I think we see a couple of trends. Um, the first trend is that wards that are heavily paved are very interested in removing those pavers um, and using our um, impervious surface removal rebate to help facilitate that and offset the cost. There, there have been a lot of areas where um, it's been just uh, overdeveloped. Um, and so people are kind of trying to undo that work. Um, and then also um, people are trying to use the BMPs in a lot of cases to mitigate um, flooding in their yards. And a big, um, challenge for River Smart Homes is to sort of, you know, explain and communicate that, you know, the, the BMPs, they help to, they can help manage a storm water on a property that's produced by that property. But in terms of mitigating a floodplain potential or storm surge um, from adjacent properties, um, you know, our BMPs are really limited. And so, um, but we do see a lot of homeowners trying to use this program to mitigate um, kind of pretty um, more severe flood vulnerabilities. Does that answer the question? So it sounds like maybe there aren't really differences between the wards, but that universally those are some of the, the common themes, regardless of where you are in DC. Yeah, and I can, yeah. I can add to that as well that um, with the program, the vast majority of folks are finding about, out about the program through word of mouth. And in wards seven and eight, that's even stronger um, in those wards than some of the others. Um, so we don't necessarily spend a lot of time or effort advertising the program, which is a great problem to have because that interest is so high. But yeah, that's one kind of long-term effect that uh, the program is expected to see as we're increasing those installations in wards seven and eight, that that word of mouth is just gonna continue to grow and grow as folks are talking to their neighbors. Um, and that's where the signage uh, component also comes into play and kind of strengthening um, just the community knowledge and understanding about the program. I will just add to that, that from my experience as a contractor with River Smart Homes, I found that a lot of Ward seven and eight participants were more pragmatic about their gardens. They wanted a garden that had a function they saw the effect of. Whereas in some of the, especially the more wealthy wards, it could be more of a theoretical, almost status symbol like, oh, my garden is green. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this isn't actually reducing water that they see wasn't as important to them as I think that was what people got excited about in Ward 7 and 8 was like, this is a problem. We fixed it. Yay. It is important to note uh, the, the the land use across the wards is also uh, pretty diverse. As Elaine mentioned, uh, wards, wards 1, 2, and 6 are uh, very densely developed. Um, wards 5, uh, 7, and 8. Uh, tend to be larger lots. Uh, there's more opportunities for green spaces, green infrastructure um, in uh, in those areas, uh, which is uh, which is what what we what we're after. We're we're looking for more opportunities to to install more gardens, uh, more native landscape, more trees. I'll also chime in all, as well uh, to a much lesser extent. Um, some participants are also thinking about financial uh, situations too with these practices, um, with the, the stormwater fees they're being charged and their perception of doing something, removing impervious surface, you know, to help them um, in that regard too. Jamie, if you want to introduce yourself and Jordan, uh, these are members of our, our team on, at the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay and um, and our partners as well, just so you know who, who is there. 
Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, so I've been working on River Smart Homes since 2008 when it started. So, um, you know, it's a wonderful program. Homeowners love it. Um, it really, um, one thing that I do say about this program, as opposed to similar programs in other jurisdictions, is that it provides a lot of resources to the homeowners in that really they just have to sign up and decide what they want to do and they get walked through the entire process it's very easy on them to actually participate in the program so um, yeah i've seen a lot of changes over the years and it's been wonderful and i was a contractor um, working with river smart homes for a long time and then recently joined the alliance team Thank you, Jamie and Jordan. Um, as any uh, other questions from our our participants before we wrap up? Well, great. Well, thank you, everybody. I'd love to uh, thank you for participating and um, and to urge you to continue to build and strengthen these partnerships um, from here on out. This conversation. You know, um, it's not the first, it won't be the last, um, and we should just continue talking. And if anyone um, would like to reach out to us, um, our contact uh, information is on the slides and on the recording, or you can um, you know, ping us in the chat. And we would love to continue these discussions and continue to build partnerships. Thank you so much, Elaine, and, and thank you to all of our participants. And of course, a special thank you to our fantastic presenters today. Um, and I am dropping in the link for SCED one more time as a reminder for folks to please provide feedback on this session. Um, so you can go into the session, pa session page and then you'll be able to see that give feedback option. Um, and if you are active on social media and you wanna share your experience from the forum, um, please do so and use the um, tags hashtag chess forum or hashtag chess collective. Um, and there is a NIFWF field liaison proposal consultation session that is at 2.30 um, and you'll be able to access a link to join that from um, the same SCED link that I put in the chat. Um, and then lastly, just a plug for Alliance's anonymous survey concerning the demographic of folks who attended the forum. Um, and this is just to contribute to their understanding of who is attending the conference and who is not. Um, so I'll drop that link into the chat for everyone. And you'll be able to access that link from the Chess Collective page on SCED as well. Um, and thank you again, everyone, for joining. And um, I hope you had a great forum experience.